Hello, hello everyone. Good evening. It's 7 p.m. and we are starting our business meeting, our July business meeting. And since 6 p.m. we've been in closed session uh, for purposes of lawfully closed meeting minutes, uh, appointment, employment, compensation, discipline, performance, and dismissal of specific employees, and litigation uh, when in action against, uh, against affecting or on behalf of a particu uh, particular district uh, has been filed or is pending before court or administrative tribunal. And I would... Uh, Entertain a motion to come out of closed session, please. So moved. Second. Great. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Great. Any nays? No? And uh, before we start our meeting this evening, um, we have one board member that uh, we have specific rules if you can participate in a, a board meeting uh, remotely and um, you can't be on vacation uh, is probably the most general one. And Terry Fielden, our vice president, is at work at a work meeting. He might be able to call in, so I would like to ask my colleagues if they would approve of Terry calling in and he's able to vote and do all and participate in the meeting if his meeting um, uh, allows him to do that. So Kristen, I'll start with you. Would you be okay with uh, Terry calling in, yeah. Donna? Yeah. I'm fine with it. Susan? Yeah. Michael? Yep. Yeah. Susan. Great. Thank you, everyone. So now let's get to our uh, meeting this evening. Our mission is to educate students to be self-directed learners, collaborative workers, complex thinkers, quality producers, and community contributors. And with that, I will ask um, Maureen for a roll call, please. Board members present, Kristen Fitzgerald, Donna Wadke, Jackie Romberg, Susan Price, Mike Yench, and Susan Kreis. Awesome. 
And so I will ask everyone to stand if you're able for the Pledge of Allegiance. We don't have our, our favorite guests here, the students, so we will start and have to do this on our own. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Certainly the students, when they come and help us, are the highlight. And um, our next agenda item, I will turn it over to our superintendent, is good news. Okay, we have a little good news. We don't have great news this time, again, because our students are out. We, we typically like to celebrate the accomplishments and the good work of our students and our staff. Uh, but a couple of points of interest. And the uh, first point goes to our audience who may be watching at home on the World Wide Web. Uh, we are coming to you through new technology. Uh, today it has been tested and works, but if you experience any difficulty, please bear with us and have patience as we work with new technology. I'll call attention to our board members on the location of cameras that are in here to help us with our webcasting of the events. Okay, and other good news, uh, just for purpose of introduction to our community, uh, joining us for their fourth board of education meeting as members of the. Uh, the district administrative team is our deputy superintendent, Kane Osborne, and our chief financial officer, Brad Kaufman. So welcome, gentlemen. Happy to have you here. And that's all I'll share for this evening. Awesome. Thank you. And our next agenda item is public comment. I have no slips. If anybody uh, in, the, in the crowd that's here this evening would like to make a public comment, uh, please come forward. We'd love to hear from you. Um, and just for everyone, for the public record, uh, if you're an individual, it's three minutes and a group five minutes. So I don't think anyone's here for a public comment, so we'll move on. Student ambassadors don't usually come in the summer. Written communication, you can look in board docs and see the written communication. Uh, superintendent, staff, school report. Sure, we have two uh, reports that uh, we're gonna share with you, and as I'm making a couple of comments, I'll invite uh, Tim and Molly to come uh, go ahead and get set up. We had intended also to bring to you under uh, superintendent, staff, and school reports this evening a report from our executive director of the Naperville Education Foundation, Ann Spihar. Unfortunately, uh, she's been called away to a family emergency and will be unable to uh, present tonight. So we'll hope to reschedule that presentation at our August or one of our future Board of Education meetings. Uh, that being said, we are prepared to present to you uh, information uh, on assessment and our assistant superintendent uh, for assessment, uh, Tim Moringa, and director of assessment, Molly Farmer, are here uh, to talk to the Board of Education about the results of a stamp assessment that was administered to some of our high school students enrolled in classical languages. So I'll turn it over to Tim and Molly. Thank you, we're pleased to uh, present the stamp for us data to you today. Um, just so you know, the uh, PowerPoint you will see and is now in board docs is, uh, has been updated to reflect um, some uh, feedback we received this morning and some of the information we're gonna present verbally, we decided to go ahead and put in the PowerPoint for your for your use. So uh, first of all, also the handouts you have in board docs include your PowerPoint, um, and also there's a, a document there from, uh, from Avant, which is the company that uh, presents us with the uh, assessment. It does explain to you on pages two through four a little more detail on the different levels we'll be describing in, in this presentation. Um, Avant uh, was part of the creation of the stamp for us to uh, provide data on language um, uh, programs. It's a test that's similar but different from the STAMP 4SE that we provided the data for you already for two years for our dual language programs. That data, those tests are similar but different and they, uh, this one's designed to test our world and classical language program and is not at all involved in the dual language or the uh, ESL program as well. Um, also uh, this is our first year in testing using the STAMP 4S and will serve as our baseline data for future year's presentations and also the data that's to come. Um, our outcomes for this presentation are to review the data from the spring administration of the STAMP 4S assessment uh, to our level uh, two French and Spanish students and also to review the next steps using this baseline data for the future. First of all, a little bit of background on the STAMP assessment. Uh, STAMP stands for um, the uh, standards-based measurement of proficiency was created by the Center for Applied uh, Second Language at the um, University of Oregon. And uh, 
it is a, a measure that um, was referenced, um, references the standards from the uh, American Council for the Teaching of Foreign Languages, or sometimes referred to as ACTFL. Uh, so this, the uh, actual standards listed there. It is a snapshot of language, and it's a, an ability based on a relationship um, using a relatively short list of um, tasks. Uh, the tests, there are four of them. The first two are um, both the interpretive reading and the interpretive listening are actual multiple choice assessments that are adaptive in nature. So as the student takes the test, if they get them correct, it will ask them more questions. If the student asks, uh, gets uh, questions incorrect, it will then cut short the assessment based on their, their knowledge level. Um, the last two are, um, are actually recorded on the computer. So the presentational writing, the students um, respond to um, information and write out their answers is recorded on the computer which is then uh, assessed by an Avant-trained external rater um, and scored off of their rubric. And then the presentational speaking is also in, in a similar fashion. The student responds verbally, recorded in our language labs, and then that information is sent to the, uh, the raters and they, they, the Avant raters then will grade it off of their rubric. It takes about a half day and it's, we administered it uh, during an in-school field trip this year in late April or early May. It does cost uh, $17.50 per student. Our target was to have about 100 students take the test in both Spanish and French. Um, in French two, that included all of our level two students. Um, we were able to make it a universal assessment uh, because of sample size of our French two classes. But in Spanish too, we have between four and 500 students in level two across the district. So um, it was recommended and we followed through from uh, Dr. Carl Fa Falsgraf to, to do it as a stratified random sample instead. And what that means is we took the students and we um, took the percentage of students that we had by grade level and also by socioeconomic status. And we then pooled our students, um, picked them randomly, and then pooled them according to that same percentage to invite them to take the test so it would be a representative sample of the actual population of the students. Um, there was an opt-out uh, option for the Spanish students um, as part of that. And then there were, as part of the test, just so you know, for the ratings level, there are three major levels. Uh, those three uh, levels are novice, intermediate, and advanced. And in each of those levels, there are three sub-levels. Uh, those three sub-levels are low, mid, and high. On the two recorded versions of the test, on the, on the written and the speaking versions, they combine the mid and the high together to make just an eighth level rather than an eighth and ninth level. This, these are the demographics of the students uh, tested by both by building and then also by uh, subject. Um, we did invite over 140 Spanish students to participate in the test. This is the demographics of the students tested by grade level. Um, as you can see, uh, we listed there um, the, what we had for each of the levels and in the uh, Spanish, our target, we were able to meet the targets in a reasonable level of efficiency. Usually that was within um, about 10%. Was The most off was the freshman level, and that was scattered between the sophomores, juniors, and seniors. We found that because we had a higher level of opt-out, as you, you might expect, of the sophomores through the seniors than from the freshman level. And then this is the demographics broken down by uh, free and reduced lunch to represent, and this is within just a few percentage points of the actual uh, level uh, given. The comparison we have to do for this uh, test comes from, uh, from Avant, and they listed for us the national averages from their 2008 through 2009 assessments. These were for the, the entirety of the assessments they gave uh, to over 29,000 students at all levels. Um, in the level we tested for level two, there was four to 5,000 students uh, tested uh, from both the U.S. and also uh, from American international schools to test their language learning um, in those schools. Um, also, our target was, again, 
if you look at these levels, we targeted to have our to measure how our students in did in achieving the intermediate to the advanced level on this. And that was because if um, what they categorized for us is that students at the intermediate or advanced level, those students uh, should be able to communicate at a level that they'd be able to uh, both survive and cope in the target language country. So that's advanced categorization of those two. So that's why we're providing some, we're gonna provide some summary data for those two uh, levels. Okay, the previous slide showed uh, the breakdown of percents at each level, but as Tim mentioned, we tried to look at level four and above. So this is the district compared to the national averages from the 2008 and nine study. So we have on the first row how French two did in the district, second row Spanish two in the district, and then the bottom is the national, which is for both French and Spanish. You'll notice in the national listening is an NA, they did not have the listening test at the time that they did the study. So they did not provide any data. But as you can see, we did extremely well compared to the benchmark. The next four slides will go through each one of the subtests. This first one is reading. On the left, you'll see the legend. On the top right, you'll see the chart for French level two. On the bottom right, you'll see the chart for Spanish level two. It's a bar chart that represents the raw number of students that obtained each one of those levels. And you'll notice for French, we had 68% at the level four and above. Spanish, we had 65%, which compares to the national averages was 5%. For listening, for French, we had 10% at the target of level four or above. Spanish, we had 19% at level four or above compared to, um, we did not have any of the national averages. For the other subtests, you'll remember it was five, 14, and seven. For writing, we had 41% at level four and above, and for Spanish, we had 69%, which compares to 14% on the national average. And for speaking, we had 18% for French and 51% for Spanish, and that compares to the 7% nationally. In terms of the next steps for curriculum development, we have already been in the process of working on the curriculum. We are using curriculum templates that um, we received from ACTFL and uh, aligning our curriculum to both the ACTFL standards and additionally to the Common Core State standards. And that's something that ACTFL is actively uh, supporting districts with. Additionally, we've been working on our assessments and redesigning those. One of the first paths that we went down was redesigning those to our capstone courses, which are the AP courses. And instead, after the work with ACTFL last year, and uh, also knowing with the endorsement of the stamp assessment, we are aligning those assessments also to the ACTFL standards. So then the very next step that we'll make in addition to the work that's been done all year long and then specifically this June is that we'll share the data with the teachers to um, have them analyze them for instructional improvement. The next steps for our research design are to take and follow the cohort of students and assess level three next year um, and then also begin a new cohort at level one so we can kind of see the comparison over time and uh, begin a longitudinal look at this data as well. Also, we'd like to look at the ramifications of uh, when the testing date comes. Uh, we did test this just following the Prairie State exam, which is a very difficult time for these students and for uh, those who might have a, an AP test just before their AP testing. So it's a very busy time assessment-wise, and so consideration has to be given as to when that might be appropriate in the future as part of that. Some of the conclusions data-wise, if you notice at the, uh, at the uh, different slides, we do see that our teachers hopefully will be able to look at this data and, and compare some of the data information, especially if you look at the, um, the different tests, 
what one of the, the tests that stood out was the listening test as to something that um, students need to uh, maybe, or our teachers need to pay attention to instructionally as to uh, how they work with that test. And then also we saw with the French uh, speaking part as well, there was a, um, there was a difference there in uh, data. And that will be an interesting one for our teachers to compare, discuss, and come up with instructional strategies as part of that process. We now welcome your questions that you have. we don't have enough kids in it that we didn't do German and is there something for Latin as well um, there are there's even for Chinese okay. as part of it um, we selected the French and the Spanish to start with um, part of that is it would allow us in the future to do some informational studies as to what um, how uh, the work was done at the junior high as well okay uh, which those are the two languages that were are in the junior high program so next year when you do level three wouldn't you expect higher numbers because these kids opt, you know, they, they self-select out. If they're not doing well, they don't stay in it. Mm -hmm. And also these numbers are aligned, so you would expect it to grow year by year. So um, the level of the student should grow from, say, they were intermediate low. You might expect the student to, to grow to intermediate high maybe or, or such. And if you were to overlay what our English, you know, language arts looks like compared to this and the scores that we've gotten, I know that it's not on the same type of test exactly did you look at anything like that like you know like what how our kids are doing on the numbers overall um, like on the prairie state over, like you know when you compare it yeah a future consideration might be to look at that sort of data is that you know students who did students who scored in the say the advanced level were they also advanced in the in their literacy skills in the uh, prairie state so that could be a future consideration for looking at the data did this information surprise you, or is it what you expected when you, because I know you're always guessing what the numbers are going to turn right. out to be. Your it is baseline data, and so it's interesting to look at to compare. Um, you know, we, I was surprised in the celebration of comparison to the national level. Oh. I did not, I did not <laughs> expect it to be anywhere close to that wide of a gap um, with that. So uh, that was, that was a surprise as part of that in a celebration. Um, I was surprised also at the level for the listening um, as part of that. We, um, it, it'll be interesting to have the discussion from the instructors to see what impact that came from. So um, looking at the, obviously the freshmen have done all of their Spanish one in um, junior high. So I'm curious if you, if you looked at the data separating it to see if, um, what the, like, if the freshman, if the sophomores taking fr Spanish one or French one in the high school are equivalent to the two years that students are spending in junior high, and if, like, if they're testing, like, I'm comparing, like, I think you get it. I don't have to go on. <laughs> exactly. Um, we did look, and out of the freshmen, there were 61 in French two that we tested. 60 did take it in junior high, so only one did not. And for Spanish two, 54 out of the 55 took it mm -hmm. in junior high. Uh, for the sophomores, juniors, and seniors, the issue of looking back in time, did they take it in junior high, is our student information system has changed. So we could make an assumption that they took level one as freshmen, but we don't know perhaps if maybe someone repeated level one. Mm -hmm. um, we did go ahead and look at it, so I'm gonna pull back up the reading slide. We did not see a big difference when you looked at the ninth graders, and then we grouped 10th, 11th, and 12th graders together mm -hmm. because when you're starting to look at those sample sizes, we're starting to dip below 40, which is kind of a dangerous level. Um, so we did not see any big difference there. When I flip to the listening, we did notice on the French, we have one student at a level five and nine at a level four. Those were all freshmen. So that was something that we noticed was a difference. Um, for Spanish, it was about the same. I'm sorry. So the Spanish didn't have that difference that French has. Yeah, okay. so the okay. freshmen I didn't know scored the about same the French same percentage-wise okay. to the 10th, 11th, and 12th when we looked at the Spanish. Okay. So we really only saw the difference 
between the freshmen and the non-freshmen, I'll call them, for French listening. Spanish was the same. I think I'd, I'm not sure if I said that right the first time. Okay. Um, I am going to flip to writing. No, sorry, I skipped one on you. I'm sorry, I'm trying to go in order with your handout if you're following along. Um, so listening, we said, is this the same, right? Sorry, now I'm toggling back and forth. Um, writing for French, the level four. There are 32 students there. 26 of them were freshmen, six of them were non-freshmen. And even when we look at the percent comparing, that was a difference in French. Spanish, when we looked at freshmen versus non-freshmen, we did not see a difference. It was about the same. Speaking, um, for French, we saw a little bit of a difference uh, in the Level four, there are 14 students. 12 of those were freshmen. Two of them were non-freshmen. Uh, for Spanish, it was, again, about the same. So that was something when you look at the results and you look at freshmen versus Spanish, and we started to wonder why, that is something we did notice in some of the subtests. Thank you. Thanks. Question. I echo Susan Karate's uh, comment on national. I, I just I don't even know what to think of that, I, or to think, isn't that pathetic? But um, is there an are, are students that have been in the immersion programs or the oldest ones are in sixth grade now, correct? Yes. So w this sixth grade they're going, going into, into sixth. sixth. I'm sorry. Yes. Correct. What am I thinking? In in September in August they'll be in sixth. They'll be right. Rising sixth grade, right. They're, they're rising sixth graders. Okay. So. Um, you would expect this to maybe have a different flavor when these sixth graders, three years down the road, when they're coming in, because they're, they're not having just the introduction in junior high and high school. They've been in this program since, um, since kindergarten. Or what would your reaction to that be? Well, and we'll probably keep that data separate, because this, this was actually the first design test was designed for uh, when the foreign language is the second language. So. Um, this would be the, the um, it would be interesting to look at the English speaking students right. and their language acquisition at, when they get to that level. So far we've only uh, studied them with the uh, Stamp 4SE and so it, it will be interesting to see as they look at their language acquisition when they get to the older ages. The heritage speakers in that dual language group would be tested with this, the Stamp 4SE because that's designed for heritage speakers. Right. As part right. of that, yeah. How, um, when you had said these are English speakers, this is their second language, uh, this whole group, mm -hmm. that whatever this, whether it's French or Spanish, it's their second language. Mm -hmm. How would that be different than English speaking students taking? No, you're correct there. Oh. We, we will be able to look at those students got it, got when it. they get to that it's grade. It's just the heritage. And, and okay. also, just one more surprise I'd like to share through the documentation that Avant shared with us is that their expectation, they actually say this is level two students. Their documentation refers to level three as usually the time where the student scores kind of explode and get, get higher. So um, there's, there's a little bit of the um, national uh, data that actually shows the level three students uh, get higher at that age. Um, it's just interesting when we get more longitudinal data to see is, is there that same effect maybe at an earlier age or maybe our kids are you know maybe that level higher. We don't know. I love numbers too. <laughs> um, so because the national is so hard to compare to, is there data available from other comparable districts that we can compare to so we have a better idea? We don't, we don't have a comparable district set anywhere nearby, I believe, where the, the ones that are giving, because this was written in the University of Oregon. It'd be interesting to study what other comparable districts across the nation might have, but um, we don't know of any other districts in this area giving this test. Thank you.
talked about the Naval Education Foundation. We will, uh, it's really an interesting report, as I mentioned, or I was talking to myself, I think they, there were some very uh, interesting new, some new programming and some exciting things. We'll look forward to that in the future. I do not have a report. Uh, and any of the board members uh, have a report they'd like to share this evening? Yes, Susan. Um, I just wanted to talk about that. I would have talked about during the Education Foundation update, but the golf outing. Yes. We had um, 31 foursomes, and it poured rain until about 12 seconds before they teed off. Mm -hmm. And um, and then deluge. It, it yes. Was terrible. And then it rained for about 30 seconds before dinner, and then it was beautiful and hot and sticky. Yeah. So everyone had a really great time. It was really fun. So. And we look forward to Ann's report. I would have only been proud to comment on the team that was second place, but then that would require me to point out that Mr. Ross and his team won the outing, so oh. I won't do that, oh, unfortunately. Yeah. I guess I just did. Um, it was a little disconcerting <clears throat> that our staff did so well and our board members did so poorly. Well, I, will, <laughs> I, I was going to suggest that there are some individuals <laughs> sitting around the table that can claim the highest score, and I will not comment. Just a great, great outing. I think you can uh, hear that in everyone's comments. Um, the next uh, part that uh, Terry um, has worked very diligently on, and that is uh, board committee liaisons and adopt a school of representatives. And if I, I'll just, I did this for a number of years before Terry did it, and I would just like to explain to our audience and staff, if the new staff members aren't familiar with this. Um, when there are community committees or superintendent committees that have community participants, it has been the tradition um, that school, uh, two school board, one or two school board members sit on those committees uh, for one or two years, depending on the committee. And uh, you can look at in, in detail in board docs and see those committees that are listed. No committee lasts forever. Uh, some, for example, uh, uh, dietary was a committee for years and, and it kind of uh, when uh, different menu items were changing and hot lunch was starting in all years back and uh, so some start and then some fade away so um, and when there's a need either from the superintendent side or from the board side for an idea of a committee we have that committee and likewise uh, disband them when it's necessary and then the second thing I'll draw your attention to is the adopted schools we have 22 schools and seven board members so we generally uh, one person takes four and somebody uh, all of us have at least three buildings where we spend a little more time it's not that we don't uh, um, uh, represent all the schools we certainly do but it's a time where we can just narrow uh, zero in a little bit more and and maybe attend a few more of their functions and maybe some of their home and school meetings if the school would like us to do that and maybe carry that flag or get to know that community a little bit better and um, and generally we never do a school more than one year at a time you uh, no matter how much you love it and they love you you get one year at that school and our board members do not do schools where their children are in school um, just a, a, a better a better practice um, if something comes up you're a little bit more independent and I will entertain any questions that any of my colleagues have or anyone else yes um, Donna and I are gonna flip-flop I've had yes. it would give me Washington junior high for right three out of the last four years so okay and I'm gonna flip her for Lincoln, Lincoln yes I yes. did hear that I right. did hear that and I and we were gonna get that changed and our board secretaries okay. on vacation we'll get that done no problem at all and again it's a little bit when board members been on the board a number of years you do happen to get to some schools a little more often uh, if you can't do the schools your children are at and you have a child in elementary junior high and high school and you can't do those schools uh, kind of narrows down some of the buildings some people can go to so um, any other questions about committees or adopted schools? No? Okay, great. Uh, and generally what happens, um, Dan or someone on his staff lets the schools know um, and whoever uh, heads up the committee for those people that are new on the staff. And Kitty Ryan and Bob Ross are in process of sending that Ross information is. right now. Yeah, and uh, they can uh, let the schools know and then it's sort of at the school's discretion uh, to contact the board members. Sometimes board members reach out to the schools. So however, however you're comfortable is great. And this brings us to our monthly reports, and uh, I will turn uh, monthly reports, treasurer's report, investments, uh, insurance report, and budget report. Um, if anyone has any questions, if not, I will turn it over to my colleague, Susan Karate, who did bills and claims this month. I had the opportunity to go through um, bills and claims for the first time with our new um, 
there you are, um, superintendent of uh, our, what's your exact title? Chief. Chief, Chief CFO. So had a nice opportunity to get to know him and um, talk through things and it was really great to hear how um, he's done things in the past and he, he shared a lot so it was a really nice opportunity. Um, one of the things that I learned while going through at this time was that um, the money for Edward Hospital had already been dispersed as required, which was one of the questions. And so um, when we got down to bills and claims, I, um, they answered all my questions for me. So um, I didn't, we didn't talk about anyone pulling anything. So um, I move approval of 8.01 through 8.08 .08 as presented and approval, I move approval of warrant number 380389 through warrant number 380925, totaling $21,263,049.49 for the period of June 18th, 2013 through July 15th, 2013. Second. Okay. Maureen wants for a Fitzgerald? No. Yeah. Yes. Hi. Price? Yes. Robert? Yes. Price? Yes. Thank you, Maureen. And the next item on our agenda is a discussion with action well, and, oh, I'm sorry. Is that an, are we being asked to vote on this? Yes, we are. So does this, is there some that this doesn't apply to the rule that we have to have things in advance no. without action? No, there's no, there's no requirement that it's without action before action. Okay, but so let me, we have to consider things twice. There's no rule for that, though. There's no rule for considering twice. I, the, uh, I, if, as I kick this off, I'll explain why it's on the agenda this time. Okay. But to my knowledge, I there is no reason. If we're spending money, we have to consider it once before and then. And that's been our practice, certainly. I thought that meeting rules required if, if, that we consider things. Well, this certainly isn't money. Right. This isn't certainly money. And at least the reading that I have done does not um, demand that it or require that the, it's without action before it's action actionable. It does not. I thought the Open Meetings Act required that if we're spending, that, that we have to have things considered. I mean, that's what the intention of the Open Meetings Act is. Mm -hmm. If this doesn't apply, then it doesn't. Well, then we would never have a con any financial stuff in the consent agenda. We do that every month. We spend money. No, 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 but for policy changes and those kinds of things, we are required to. This isn't a policy okay, change right. either. So let me, uh, I hear what you're saying. Are you comfortable? Let me, yeah, no, okay. Fine. okay. So um, in this particular, I, uh, it's 9.01, just so we haven't further confused everyone. 9.01, IASB resolution proposal. Terry Fielden, who isn't here this evening, was approached by a board member in uh, Glen Ellen District 41, Erica Nelson. Um, they had a tremendous interest in trying to get an IA IASB resolution for unfunded mandates. Um, and uh, so as that the districts have a better understanding of what these, uh, the demands that are going to be placed upon them and they know about them in advance. And he thought this would be a great introduction for one of our new colleagues, for Kristen Fitzgerald, to get involved because she's done policy work before um, with Erica and um, uh, District 41 was looking for someone to co-chair this with them. So what will happen in this process, and, and the reason it's ended up uh, to what Susan's referring to, we usually like to look at things a couple of times and let everybody kind of digest um, different, um, different topics. The, the way the time frame is working, and when we got introduced to this, the time frame for the IASB to review this, the committee date, is on August 2nd. So we did not have another meeting, which made it, uh, and we only have one meeting in July, so it was really an actionable item. We need to vote as a board that this proposal is something that we're comfortable with as a board, and then um, it will go up the chain of command, I'll go through the committee work, IASB into the national convention, the I convention, that which, is, which is in November. But first and foremost, um, before we as a board read this resolution, um, it's always incumbent upon us to make sure our superintendent and his staff are comfortable with it. So I will let um, you know, just just briefly in, in terms of looking at it, I think one of the, looking at this proposal uh, and why this would be of interest to us as a school district is it speaks to the importance of partnering with our legislators and understanding uh, potential costs for mandates that may come from the ISBE or from the, or from the state. 
One of the frustrating things that school districts deal with annually is the uncertainty of state funding and just how much education dollars will be appropriated uh, to school districts, and that makes budgeting and forecasting difficult. Uh, so for us, having a better sense or, or supporting uh, a proposal that may be then brought forward for the Illinois Association of School Boards uh, it, for a position statement, I think is something that uh, would be important and that, that from an administrative standpoint, we would stand behind and support because it helps us, it would help Mr. Kaufman with budgeting and planning to have a better sense of um, you know, revenue that will be attached to certain mandates that are brought forward by the state. So we would support it. Thank you, and I will turn this over to our colleague, Kristen, who has, uh, um, has a little bit of background for us, and then after, uh, we will vote on it, and then I, we have something we will sign, and then Kristen, on our behalf, will submit this uh, to the Resolutions Committee at the IASB. Okay, Kristen. So uh, I think Jackie kind of described the situation. Um, Glenn Ellen had come to us wanting to partner, and so. Mrs. Fitzgerald, can you turn it on? It's on, I did turn it on, it's just probably not close enough. Okay. So um, I've been working with Erica since May um, to work on developing this resolution. And we looked at a couple of different things, and, and Dan's referenced them. Um, it's a really tight economic climate, and we have um, unpredictable state and federal reimbursement and usually reduced um, federal reimbursement and state reimbursement. Um, at the same time, we're looking at increasing academic rigor, which puts additional demands on the school districts. And we have the pension obligations, which may also put additional financial pressure on school districts. And we know that as partners with us, our state legislators are concerned about this, and they want us to be able to plan and that kind of thing as well. At the same time, many well-meaning pieces of legislation do put a cost on school districts. And it's increasing. So during 1990 to 2000, um, there were, I think I have down 12 unfunded mandates or underfunded mandates. Since 2000, there have been 116. So the burden has increased, and at this tight time, it's difficult for school districts. There is a process currently through the, through the Illinois State Mandates Act, which requires the compilation of a fiscal note, which would estimate the budgetary impact. Unfortunately, that's not always consistently implemented. Um, if legislators are in, for example, a hurry, they would waive the State Mandates Act. And so, then you wouldn't have that information. In addition, though they might be required to go to the Illinois State Board of Education, the Illinois State Board, Board of Education is not always required to notify school districts and to find out from school districts what would this cost be so that the school districts are aware of the legislation and so that the um, Illinois State Board of Education is able to adequately If, for example, the Mandates Act is waived because we're in a hurry, sometimes maybe the House would be in a hurry, but then it wouldn't go forward in the Senate for a long time. Maybe it's in a time frame where we still have to provide the information about the impact. Mm -hmm. So you were able to ask them to provide for that information. So that would be nice additional um, information for school di districts. Um, also looking at potentially requiring the Illinois State Board of Education to notify school districts or that kind of thing. So looking at a, 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 a variety of different legislative changes. So if we go forward today, if our board approves the resolution today, um, Glenn Allen acted last month and they have gone ahead and submitted it. It made the June 19th deadline that was necessary in order to be considered this year. If we approve it today, we become a co-sponsor and we would be able to um, be part of the process of moving the resolution forward. Um, this week, the Illinois Association of School Boards will send staff responses with additional research. We have worked quite a bit with the Illinois Association of School Boards. They're very aware of what we're doing, very comfortable, have a lot of um, information that we've gone back and forth with, so I don't expect a whole lot more information than what we have right now in that notice. Um, the Resolutions Committee, as you've already mentioned, meets August 2nd to discuss the resolutions, and we would be invited to come and testify. Um, and then the Resolutions Committee would make a recommendation whether or not to support or adopt. And each school district would re review a report to membership that includes this recommendation and send a delegate to the Delegate Assembly and then act at that assembly. And then they would, and if it is approved, 
they, they, this would become part of the policy agenda for ISB and be written into legislation. Um, I think it's important to also um, note we've done um, the best in crafting it that we can to approach this as a partnership. Um, you know, not trying to be accusatory and say, gosh, there's so many unfunded mandates, but to say, we're partners with you. We agree with, uh, you know, a lot of the legislation going forward. It's important to understand the costs and that kind of, uh, kind of thing and approach it as a partnership with our legislators. So that's kind of background. If anybody has any questions or anything more, I'm happy to discuss. Mm -hmm. I, think, um, I think I'm looking for a motion, please. Is there I'll motion to approve. Okay, we have a motion and a second on the floor for the IASB resolution proposal um, that Kristen has just presented. Um, any comments or questions? Makes perfect sense to me, so uh, I'm sure it won't get anywhere in the state legislature. But um, <laughs> it's, uh, it's a sound policy, it makes sense, it's logical, it's not overreaching. Right. It doesn't put any real demands on them other than to think about what they're doing. So uh, uh, we'll see what happens. Right. And I, I think as I uh, talked to um, a couple of other uh, districts, um, had time, had there been more time, there might have been some more districts that would have uh, liked to have participated. It's a cumbersome process. I think also the flip side is the more districts you get involved, the more cumbersome it gets. It's great to have that unity, but uh, I appreciate, Kristen, all of your help. Uh, and all of your work on this, and um, and let's let's watch it going forward. So, um, Maureen, we'll take a roll call, please. Romberg, yes. Warnke, yes. Crotty, yes. Dench, hi. Fitzgerald, and Price, yes. Majority. Thank you, everyone. Okay, do. Uh, we have no new business, or does anybody have a new 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 business or old business? We have our scheduled events. Uh, we're into, uh, oh my goodness, June 14th. We have second semester. I'm sorry, I don't even, I'm yelling instead of using my microphones. I'm sorry. I was always so excited when the December dates were so appreciative when these dates get put on here. And now I'm looking, I, I didn't even scroll down when I was going through board docs before. Um, earlier that uh, we have through, we're through the whole calendar year, which is awesome. Awesome, awesome, and we certainly understand there's tentative dates and they need to change, and I think our, our practice is trying to be, if we're changing them, we're putting them in red, and our secretary, our board secretary, is uh, um, uh, very, knows about that. Uh, the next thing on our agenda is a planning, uh, planning meeting agenda preview, and I will uh, let uh, our superintendent talk about that this Friday and Saturday morning. Uh, is a reminder to the Board of Education and, and also the community, we have posted uh, a meeting for Friday and Saturday of this week for the purpose of planning. Uh, it is uh, our intent, uh, uh, President uh, Romberg, Vice President Field and I, to work with the Board of Education in terms of one of the significant things that we'll do is spend time reviewing and discussing the community feedback we've received through, through Future Focus 203. And also as a Board of Education, have an opportunity to, to discuss uh, as a group uh, some of the same activities that we've asked our community to do. Uh, then that'll allow us to have conversation about planning and priorities for the coming school year 2013-2014. Uh, so excited, looking forward to the event. And if you have any specific questions about the agenda, uh, we meet again at 4 o'clock on Friday and then again at 8 a.m. on Saturday morning. Um, no, no Hawaiian dress code. We have no dress code we've discussed, so everyone's entitled can use their imagination or creativity. All of a sudden, I was thinking of that. A Friday evening and a Saturday morning. Hmm. Everyone well, can use it. Saturday? We said till we, 2. We said yeah. till 2. We're hoping closer to 1. But yeah. it depends on how robust. In terms of planning schedule, we've planned for Friday night from 4 to about 8 o'clock. And then again, 8 a.m. on Saturday. Um, thinking that on the, on the long end, it would be 2 o'clock. And uh, Leah, I guess that we've got our motion to adjourn. If I will entertain a motion. I think this is the earliest ever. Mm -hmm. I move to adjourn. It's like it's summer. Um, all in favor? Second. <laughs> oh, sorry, sorry, Michael. <laughs> sorry. Thank you. Yeah. Aye. Second. Yeah. All in favor? Aye. Any nays? Motion carries. Thank you, everyone. Wow. Okay, so now I can have.